Welcome to Last First Date Radio, featuring interviews with experts in dating, relating, and mating in midlife. And now, here's your host, Sandy Weiner. This is episode number 448 with John Berger, Why Women Should Make the First Move. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner, and welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe a woman of value naturally attracts the respect she deserves in life and love. So if you're looking to build up your confidence and show up more authentically in your life, I wrote a book just for you, and it's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. It's filled with 30 tips and exercises to help you step more fully into your value, and it's a value available on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. And I share a tip every week from the book. This week's tip is don't be a people pleaser. I just did a whole video on people pleasing. Uh, when we people please, we actually are not showing up authentically. We're, we're doing things out of alignment with who we really are. And if you find yourself drained constantly and always doing for people and feeling resentful afterwards, you are probably a people pleaser. So my challenge to you this week is to be aware the next time you say yes to something that you don't want to say yes to and take a pause. Tell someone, I'll get back to you in 24 hours. That's a great way not to go into that auto yes. Before I bring John on, I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. It's called Your Last First Date, and we are a fantastic group for women over 40 who are looking to grow in their development of skills and confidence to date and go on their last first date. So join us there. And now for my guest, John Berger. He is an award-winning magazine writer, and he's the author of two dating books. The first one is Date Anomics, and that was published in 2015. And his new book, Make Your Move, The New Science of Dating and Why Women Are in Charge. I am excited to talk to him today about that book. He is a former senior writer at Fortune, and he's also a familiar face and voice on TV, radio, and podcasts, including mine. And he has appeared on ABC's Good Morning America, BBC World Service, Girls Gotta Eat, CNBC, CNN, MSNBC, NPR, Fox News. And he's discussed topics ranging from dating to investing. I would say that dating is an investment. <laughs> a graduate of Brown University, John lives with his family in Larchmont, New York, which is very close to where I live. Welcome back to the show, John. Hey, Sandy. Thanks for having <laughs> me back on. Yeah. So you've written two books on dating and you're happily married, I'm assuming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am happily married, yeah. Well, so at least, at least I, I think I am. You might need to talk to Laura about it, but yes. <laughs> well, at least one of you thinks you're happily married. That's better than a lot of people. <laughs> um, so, John, what inspired you, first of all, to write about dating in general, but to write this book in particular? So, yeah, the, 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 the how did you ever, ever end up writing a dating book question is usually the first I get because I, I don't, I mean, obviously I don't have the typical profile. Like I, you know, I, I wrote about really boring stuff at Fortune, like oil and gas and the stock market. Um, so the, the, the backstory is that the editorial staff at Fortune was disproportionately women. And I couldn't help but notice that most of the guys were either married like myself or involved in long-term relationships. Whereas the women who I think I can honestly say had more going for them dating wise than we guys did, um, they were disproportionately single and unhappily single. And the ones I was friends with had these kind of horrible dating histories and dating stories. And you know, I had been married since my mid twenties. So I've been out of the dating market. Um, and I couldn't figure out why dating was so much harder for these women in particular, but it really, you know, it was all my female friends who were, who were single. They, it just seemed so much harder for them, whereas my guy friends didn't seem to have any trouble at all. So I think th this was the origin of the first book, Datanomics. And the, the short version is that it explores how lopsided gender ratios among college grads have spilled over into post-college dating. Um, the book was more pop science than an advice book, as you, as you may recall. Um, and it shows how you know, past 
20, 30 years, we've had four women graduate from college for every three men. So in, in what I call the white collar dating world, there's now one third more women than men. And you know, the book explores how, how that makes not only the numbers more difficult for women, but it changes behavior too, and it, and it kind of promotes the hookup culture. But um, I think I had it, I had a very snooty view towards the whole self-help genre when I wrote the first book. Um, I don't know, I don't know, did that come across the last time we spoke? <laughs> I, don't I don't think so. <laughs> um, uh, I, I didn't view myself as the love doctor and th there was very little advice in the first book and that was kind of by design because I, I thought the whole knowledge is power thing would be enough. Like I, I thought that women who read the book would kind of have an aha moment and thought, oh great, it's not my fault. There's something bigger going on. And I thought that that would be enough. But I, I, from, from your nodding, I can tell that you, you could have told me ahead of time that that would not be enough. Um, <laughs> and uh, women would show up at my book talks and saying, you know, okay, I get it. I feel a little better now, but tell me what to do. And I didn't really have a great answer for them then. And that's what led me to write the, the new book, Make Your Move. Um, there are a lot of like articles out there that celebrate women being single and, you know, screw those men who, you know, you feel you have to settle for. And it just, to me, it's not really helping. It's like, okay, I get it. The, you know, a lot of women do settle, but what, what can we do? And how can we get past these barriers? Because so many successful women in particular and educated women are misguided. And that's why I started my career because I had been misguided. I ended up in the wrong marriage and I wanted to figure out how to unpack all of, all of the, the, the false information I was fed and the, 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 the ideas and society fed ideas about dating and women and men. And, and that's why I, I'm excited about this book because so much of what I discovered is that women are still subscribing to old norms in dating. So I, I mean, I do like to start out with a little bit of a, a caveat and that is I do not assume that everybody you know, that, that nobody's happy being single. And I don't assume that marriage or monogamy are for everybody. Um, but I, you know, people who buy dating books or listen to dating podcasts, um, you know, don't tend to be looking for platonic friends or one-time hookups or things like that. So that kind of influences, uh, you know, the way I go about my writing and I'm sure the way that you you handle your your business, your podcast. So, but but I but just as a I I I understand that people can live a perfectly happy happy life without marriage, staying single, etc. But um, that said, you know if you prioritize marriage, um, my advice is to kind of live your life that way, and. What I discovered when I began thinking about writing Make Your Move is that so many of the women I knew who um, hadn't really had some of the problems I wrote about in datanomics, despite the lopsided gender ratios, so many of them were basically bucking all the traditional gender related dating roles and dating norms and were living their life authentically the same way, like they were doing the same thing in dating that they were doing professionally, uh, you know, with their, you know, some of them, some were in back, involved in politics or in the fitness industry. And um, if they were just going for it in business, why not just go for it in, um, you know, in romance as well. And uh, just, it, it just became clear to me both from interviewing women who, um, who had found love that um, ignoring all these so-called rules on playing hard to get, being passive, waiting and waiting and waiting for a guy to notice you, um, that, that didn't really work so well. And it really doesn't work well in the post Me Too world. So a big theme of the book is kind of ignoring all the antiquated rules about who's supposed to do what 
when it comes to dating and not being afraid to put yourself out there uh, because I think particularly in this environment, a woman who is willing to take chances, the payoff for her can be enormous. I totally agree with you on um, women making the first move and not being passive. I, I, I see so many women who are so active in their work life and in all other parts of their lives are sitting there just going, I want to be chosen and I want men to chase me. We had a whole conversation in my Facebook group the other day about why do men ask me what, you know, to pick a place for the date? They should be picking the place. Like, <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of just expectations of, you know, uh, how about looking at it in another way, which is to me, a man who says you picked a place might've been rejected a million times, especially when he's, you know, 65 years old and he's been doing this for a long time. And he says, Hey, let, I'll take you out to Italian food. And she goes, I hate Italian food. <laughs> right. So it's like, you know, the constant rejection and how about seeing it as, and I mean, to me, it's, it could be, he's trying to make you happy. You know, instead of he should be the man. So yeah, yeah, look, I, 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 I've been I've been married twenty five <laughs> years, and I still have that restaurant, you know, you know, <laughs> disagreement with my wife, or 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 takeout, whatever, where you suggest something, she goes along with it, and not until the fork is lifted do you realize that's not what she wanted. So <laughs> I, think, I think we've all had that experience, but I do. I, it makes. You know, I, I think guys these days, at least when it comes to like dating and first dates, circling back to that, I think there's a certain, you know, we're kind of at this transitional phase in which guys aren't sure anymore um, when it's okay to be bold and assertive uh, and when it's not. Um, and you know, so much of the conventional dating advice and these dating Bibles that have come out over the past you know, 30 years, books from the rules to ignore the guy, get the guy, they advocate this very, very complicated version of playing hard to get. Um, and look, I, I wasn't dating in 1978. Maybe it worked well back then. I, I, I'm not going to deny that possibility. Um, but the reality is that, that the message these books and the and this this approach to dating, the, the message that, that that they want young women to send to young men basically boils down to not interested means keep trying, right? And um, look, I guys may not have learned all the lessons of Me Too as well or as quickly as we should have or should be, but I think most you know, normal guys have realized at this point that if a woman seems disinterested, the correct response is not to assume she's playing hard to get and wants to be pursued and chased. The correct response is to leave her alone. So if that if that's where our culture is headed, and I think it's a generally a good thing, it kind of requires like a kind of a recalibration of what, what we are going to expect from men and what's gonna work for women when it comes to dating. I totally hear you on that. I think Me Too has, has helped in many ways. It's also confused in many ways. There's a lot of like going overboard with consent with some men, it's like, uh, can I touch you? Can I hold your hand? Can I ask you out? Let me, you know, and women are like, just freaking ask me out already. Like they want the man to, to take charge and do those things. And the men are a fear, fearful that they're going to get knocked down for it. So, you know, how, how do we get the message out there? And I, I think for, for me, it's a lot, of, a lot of it is about what we communicate as women to men. I like it when you know, and I'll fill in the blank. Like I, I dated a guy recently who said real men don't talk about feelings. Real men are not vulnerable. Real men, all these things. And I said, you know, I like, I'm attracted to men who share their feelings. I'm attracted to men who are willing to work on themselves. That's very sexy to me. But he was so old school and fearful of opening. So yeah, can you speak to that? 
I mean, I, I actually think the younger guys, like the 20-somethings, it's almost, it's the opposite. I think they're very mm. in touch with their feelings and um, very willing to to share and in, in a moat, I guess, is a way of putting it in a way that their dads uh, never would have been. But I think what comes with that, and I don't know how, like, I don't know how many Gen Xers you've, you've talked to about dating with but but they have this kind of next level fear of awkwardness and um particularly the guys i think me too has something to do with it so it becomes actually easier for them to ask can i put my hand on your shoulder can i hold your hand W you know, would you like to go back to my apartment for sex like it it, it becomes th there's I, I, the way I like to describe it is that the transactional sterility of online dating is infecting everything. And um, I, I, I think there's, you know, I, I think young singles in particular are kind of missing out on some of the, like the, 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 there's a risk taking invo obviously involves risk, but there's a huge payoff that goes with it. And that moment when you, reach out to hold somebody's hand for the first time and they reciprocate like that isn't just fun in the moment it's a way of kind of developing a deeper connection over time and it builds trust and you know all the question asking that you see nowadays and i'm and i'm not you know when i talk about consent i'm not talking about sex or things like that. I'm just talking about what you mentioned, like, you know, these half hugs and the first kisses and the hand holding and stuff like that. I, I just, I, I feel like um, young people are missing out, but at the same time, I understand why guys are, are a little gun shy. So a woman who's willing to kind of make the first move, I, it just ha has an advantage. But I will say, it, you know, the whenever I talk about this, the rule followers out there like to throw out this image of a woman chasing a guy down the street, essentially. And it's like a scare tactic. Uh, and that's not at all what I'm talking about. I mean, there's a story I tell in the book about a young-ish, I think she's probably 29 or 30 year old woman I know. Um, she has kind of an outsized personality. And as you get problem is you know like the the extrovert thing kind of can scare off some guys and this has been a little bit of an issue for her dating wise um and she was telling me about how she got together with her current boyfriend and she said she was at a party they were they were really hitting it off they were talking for like a half an hour but it was clear that the guy was nervous or he didn't wasn't really sure what to do so she, she just blurted out so are you going to ask for my number and that was it you know, I mean, she didn't have to grab his ass or, or ask him out on a proper date or anything like that. All she had to do was open the door wide enough for him to feel safe and comfortable about walking through. And, and that's what I, what I mean when I talk about women making the first move. Yeah, so I call that the green light, you know, yeah. to yeah. let a man know it's safe to make a move. And I think a lot of women are holding back so much that men have no clue that they're even interested. So I love that example because she's like, hey, are you gonna ask for my number? It's, I'm obviously interested enough in you. And so I think what, what happens in this conversation is that a lot of people think that making the first move is overly aggressive. And I think I've seen women go to that extreme where like the woman you're describing possibly had this going on for her dating life, which is you show up in your dating life and you're as combative as you are in your work life, you know, where you right or wrong and battling and um, being overly um, aggressive. So um, can you speak to the difference between making the first move? I mean, you started to talk about it just now, but, and, and being like showing up with your work self and, Mm, I'm ooh, tough kind of persona. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think like th there's this uh, fear of see seeming too aggressive or, or or desperate or things like that. And I, I just think like you need like a, this is where like common sense kicks in. Um, you know, if, if you wouldn't, you know, 
text your best friend 20 times in one day, you probably shouldn't be texting your boyfriend 20 times either. And you know, there's a story I tell in the book. I, I, um, I coach Little League Baseball and I have you know, for a long time. And it was this one year that I was paired with a co-coach who obviously thought that we were gonna be best buddies. I mean, he, he would call me particularly early in the season, like five, six, seven times a day and like send me these elaborate emails with like ideas for the games. And like, after a while, my wife was joking that she was getting jealous. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and like, I desperately wanted to break up with him and we weren't even dating. So I, I just think if like you, you allow common sense to apply, like, I, I don't think it's that hard. But I, I do think because women have been socialized to believe that a woman, that a man, that if you show too much interest in a man, he will become less interested in you. Um, I think a lot of single women take it to the opposite extreme and believe that, that the only way a guy will like you is if you kind of feign this interest or even feign this like. And, um, you know, he needs to kind of convince you um, or you need to pretend that you need to be convinced. And I, I, I honestly, I've yet to meet the guy who broke up with a woman he really liked just because she was too enthusiastic about it. I want to just clarify what I mean. I, I, I agree. Enthusiasm is good. Overly, you know, the, the, the story you told about the, <laughs> the little guy, Yeah, that's, uh, that's a little stocky. Um, but what, what I'm saying is it, it's kind of like what Rachel Greenwald talked about in her book, Have a Met Hello, where she, for, are you familiar with that book? I'm not, I'm not. So she's a matchmaker and dating coach who went to Harvard for her MBA and for her master's thesis, she, she did um, exit interviews with men who had rejected women for a second date and asked them why they didn't ask the women out again. And then she asked the women why they thought she wasn't asked out again. And the, 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 the answers did not match. So women, not, yeah. women's number one reason for thinking they weren't asked out again was that they were intimidating to men. The successful women who thought, you know, men are just, you know, they just don't feel like they can match up to them. The men, number one, their, their number one answer was that the women were too bossy. And so when we talk about aggressiveness, that's what I'm talking about. It's the bossiness of, of making somebody wrong. When somebody says, would you like Italian food? And they go, no, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I, you know, why would you ask me out for a Tuesday night when that's obviously laundry night? You know, it's, it's I mean, I'm being extreme here, but I'm saying, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, so there's, we can, Tell me I'm wrong, please. But <laughs> there's a little part of me that hears that exit interview story and thinks that um, neither response is true. Yeah. Because, because um, I think like breakups are not exit interviews. And the goal is not to give an honest assessment of what went wrong. It's in some ways to make yourself feel better um, about what just transpired. And, and if it's actually a, a, a real legitimate breakup where you have to, you know, you're breaking up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, it's to try to minimize the drama. And, and so there's less, you know, um, less rec recrimination, so to speak, after the fact. So I, to me, when I hear those two responses, the guys don't want to admit that the woman didn't seem into him. And the women didn't want to admit that it was anything other than their awesomeness <laughs> that, you know, that, that, that prevented them from, from asking them out a second time. So I, I'm distrustful of those two answers. That's interesting. I like that. I, I, I always say, take responsibility for whatever, if you really like the person, take responsibility for something you may have said or done that didn't work, you know, really try to figure out like, am I, am I too guarded? Am I, you know, am I bringing a boring conversation to dating? Am I just, am I talking about all my old crap and not, not really focusing on connection? I mean, I right. think there's so much we can bring to the table that many people just don't. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, my my little mantra when it comes to men is that men like women who like them. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and um, the problem, of course, is women have been taught the exact opposite for so long <laughs> that that you end up with this disconnect, particularly on first dates, where women think they they sh you know that they have to hold not, not hold back isn't the right way to say it but that th they can't if if they really hit it off with the person they're not supposed to express that but the reality is there's nothing a, a guy likes more than a than a woman who seems to appreciate his company and there was one woman i interviewed for the book um who you know this has been her her the, you know she'd always made the first move with men and she told me that it's so much easier because when a guy isn't fearful of rejection, it just ramps up how often he reaches out to you. Um, and I, and I kind of think it applies to a first date as well, that if, if a guy thinks that a woman is having a really good time with him and really likes him, um, he, he's, it's very likely he's going to ask her out again. Now I'm not telling a woman to pretend to like somebody she doesn't actually like, you know, there's no point in doing that. But, it, but um, my messaging is more that, look, if there's somebody you, you really like, why would you feign dislike? I agree. I mean, I tell women to be really clear about that at the end of a date, to say, I had a great time and I'd love to see you again. <laughs> I mean, you know, I had a great time is such a pat response to the end of a date that so many people say it without meaning it. And I say, if you mean it, say it and let, give the green light. Again, it's so important to, to in, during the date too, to just say, wow, I really like that. I like that you said that. I am attracted to people who do that. I, you know, we, we, we have this cool, calm exterior. I even see it. I have two millennial children who are dating and <clears throat> a boy and a girl. And so seeing it from both perspectives and they're very different people, it's been fascinating to watch. Like my daughter will be the cool, the cool one. Like she will not assert her needs and, you know, until it's like way down the road. And my son uh, is much more expressive. He's the, 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 the guy that you, that, that you described before where he's extremely um, aware of who he is. He gets off text really quickly and says, this is a phone conversation. I don't wanna go down the road of texting this kind of stuff. And, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's wonderful when you have people who are that clear, <clears throat> but many people still are not. And I see it in all generations. Right, but, but the fact that most people are not clear and um, are so afraid of vulnerability and mm -hmm. awkwardness gives this enormous advantage to those of us who are willing to embrace the awkwardness, who are willing to embrace the, the vulnerability. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of that Brene Brown line from Darren Greatly, where she, I, this, I think this is verbatim, although it's, if not, it's close, where she says that, um, Vulnerability is weakness in me, but courage in you. Mm. Um, maybe it's the other way. It's yeah, no, that that that's the gist of it. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah. But <laughs> um, and it's so true. I mean, like, I mean, I, somebody who is willing to put themselves out there romantically just has such a big advantage because you know it's it, most of us aren't used to that. Yeah, even just saying I, I'm nervous meeting you. I, I'm yeah. I'm excited to be here. Like this is scary for me. It, it yeah. just it's like yeah. putting it out there. Like how and, and also I mean and I think from you know women in particular are always cautious and worried about being taken advantage of by a guy. But the irony is, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on this. That the the more you put yourself out there, the less likely the guy is going to take advantage of you. Like if you casually ask a guy, hey, let's go get a drink after work, th that could mean a gazillion different things in his mind. But if you say, if you tell that same guy, look, I've always liked you. I, I feel really happy around you. I feel comfortable around you. Would you like to go out on a date with me on Friday night? It, it, it's going to evoke a very different, more empathetic response and I, I think it's actually less likely that that guy is going to take advantage of you than if you do it the other way.
This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. Whenever I cook, I love listening to music from the 70s, like The Grateful Dead and Crosby, Stills and Nash, and my favorite, Joni Mitchell. With Amazon Music Unlimited, I can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. And you can now stream your favorite podcasts, like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any device, whether it's your smartphone or tablet, your PC or your Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled device like the Amazon Echo. You will never hear or see an ad, and you can even download songs and podcasts and playlists to listen to offline. Amazon Music Unlimited gets to know you, and it personalizes your recommendations based on what you like. So if you're looking for the perfect romantic dinner playlist, or the latest hits from Billie Eilish, or even recommendations for new music that you can discover, Amazon Music Unlimited has it all. Now for a limited time, you can get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 90 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com forward slash last first date to claim this offer. The piece that a lot of people are missing is they don't know what their standards are. So they, they, they are willing to adapt to what other people's needs are or requests are when it's not really working for them. So if you're saying the woman asks the man out, she also has the right to say, I need to take it slow or. Oh yeah. 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 So but, 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 but I, you know, I actually think the guy is more, oh yeah, I'm not talking about like jumping in the bed with somebody if that's, if that's where, what you're thinking. Um, I, I actually think as long as a guy isn't fearful of rejection, yeah. um, he's, he's not going to be, I think part of like the hyper masculinity of traditional male suitors is this belief that the role of the guy is to basically break down the resistance of the woman. But when a guy, when you disarm a guy and you make him make it clear to him that she actually likes him, I kind of feel like there's less, um, it kind of takes everything down a notch and it's easier for the guy to just, you know, take it as it comes. Yeah, I totally hear that. So you were talking about work romance. Um, yeah. And so let's, let's go there. Yeah. And I know, you know, a lot of people stay away from workplace because it gets awkward if you break up and how do you, so how do you negotiate all of this without messing up your job or your mental health? Cause a lot of people afterwards are like, Oh my God, I have to see them. I mean, I've seen this, way out before um yeah, look i the, the re, i mean the reason i'm a huge fan of workplace dating um is because the marriage rate is so high so if you look at the at the studies on this the the marriage rate of people who meet in the workplace depending upon the study you, you want to believe is either 25 percent or 30 percent I mean, that is incredibly high, um, you know, and I don't think you need like a degree in relationship science to kind of figure out why workplace romances are so um, promising when it comes to, to kind of finding a life partner. And that's because if you're dating somebody at work, you already know the person. Um, you, and there's, there are really few things that reveal character more than watching somebody in the workplace. Because if, if a man is dishonest or unkind from nine to five, he's going to be dishonest and unkind in a relationship after work and vice versa. I mean, if he's a, if, a, if he's a good person, if he's funny, if he's, if he's you know, nice to be around in the workplace, it'll be probably the same, you know, in a relationship as well. So it's, it's, you can see people in action. And honestly, before you get to the first date, I mean, if, if you go on a, a first date with somebody you've worked with for eight months or a year, um, you're already like halfway there practically. I mean, you already know um, 
many things important about the other person. You already have a sense of whether there's chemistry, you have a sense of whether your senses of humor mesh. So my belief, my argument is why the heck would you start from zero with a complete stranger on a dating app um, when you can already be halfway there with somebody you actually know and like from the real world? Yeah, there, there are a lot of good reasons why the workplace romance does work out. I totally hear that. And we tend to like people more when we get to know them better. Right. I, I, that's, yeah. there's, there's definitely bias towards that. And I just, I just uh, interviewed Logan Yuri, who wrote the book, How to Not Die Alone, which is all about behavioral science. And one of her chapters yeah. is about this. So, but then there are all these workplace romances and I've seen it many times where it doesn't work out and then you have to work with them. So- yeah, well, look, we think about the alternative. I mean, I mean, I know Logan a little bit, and I think she, you know, she works for Match Group. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yes, I'm not, I'm not denying that there are problems with workplace dating that and issues that have to be overcome. But if the alternative is online dating, so you know, the, the most you know, Pew Research had a survey last year that showed that. Um, a majority of women have experienced um, harassment on dating apps. A majority of women believe online dating is unsafe. And 20% of women have experienced threats of violence on dating apps. Um, so yes, I understand that there is a degree of awkwardness if things don't go right um, in workplace dating. But I think there, you know, that's dating in general. Like there was, you know, there was always going to be a, you know, a risk of rejection or the possibility of awkwardness. I mean, that that's life. And I just think the the advantages of dating people you actually know in real world in the real world, whether it's from your friend group, um, whether it's from a house house of worship. I mean, you're still going to have to see. You know, if you're a church goer or a temple goer, you're still going to have to see that person once a week, and there still is the potential of awkwardness if it doesn't work out, um, just as there would be in the workplace. But the the success rate with workplace dating is just so high that I I, I feel like it's um it's worth the chance. But um, obviously, it's more complicated now than it may have been twenty years ago. So I think I think there are smart ways to go about it in less yeah. smart ways as well. And we can talk about that if you want. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I, I totally hear you on the, um, the fact that online dating has so many risks and it also has a lot of advantages. And I, I think that a lot of people also do not have a workplace. Like I don't have one, I, I work for me. Right. So um, I could date myself, which I do on a regular basis, but um, so, so, yeah. So, so I, I'm, I have a friend who's a, um, a college professor at Rollins College in Florida, and um, she's an English professor. And Rollins has this class that graduating seniors are required to take. It's kind of a life skills class, like an adulting 101 class. <laughs> and it's everything from like basic personal finance that you need to know as a young adult to relationship stuff. And um, she hit this professor had read an advanced review copy of Make Your Move and asked me to speak to this class. And it was like 30 kids in the class. Um, and a lot of my talk to them, and this was on Zoom, a lot of my talk to them involved my misgivings and all the reasons why I don't like online dating from the physical, from the safety risks to the high breakup rates. Um, so I went through all my reasons why I don't like online dating. And at the end of the class, a young woman at, you know, said to me, okay, I hear what you're saying, but how am I supposed to meet somebody if not through a dating app? So I put the, I put Zoom into Brady Bunch mode and I said, okay, guys, I'm going to ask you a question and I want to see a show of hands. And the question was, how many of you have somebody in the real world, somebody you know and like who's single and you're attracted to, how many of you have somebody like that whom you've ever wondered about dating? 30 kids in the class, 30 hands went up. So whether it's the workplace or your bird watching club or your house of worship, uh, I truly believe that 
You know, and I ask that question a lot. And, I, and about 70% of the time, the answer is yes. So I really believe that most of us, not all of us, but most of us, most singles already know somebody um, who they want to date, but are probably just afraid to ask. Yeah, I think that's probably more true for younger people who are. I, I would say right? no, that's fair. Yeah, I, the, yeah. The, yeah. The you know when I ask this question of people in their twenties, it's like a hundred percent. Yes, right. <laughs> maybe it's maybe fifty percent with older singles. Yeah, I mean, my daughter had a breakup, and three minutes later, there was a guy who had been interested in her before right. and started messaging right. her. It's like, but, but 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 I'll give you another example. There was, a, you know, I did a, I was on a Christian dating podcast, and you know, I, I asked her the same question, and you know, she had had all sorts of of struggles with online dating, and I asked her the same question, and she said the answer was yes. Um, and I, you know, I just got an email from her, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read sure. verbatim. What, what she said to me after. So, so there was a guy, she's in, she's in her mid late thirties and there was a guy who she had wondered about dating. And this is what she wrote to me. Uh, she, um, and it turned out she had taken my advice and she had asked this guy out. Here's what she wrote. We, we are now dating. We had mutual friends and interests and I messaged him on Twitter and we go out on dates once a week. Still very early into things, but the story thus far seems to highlight the wisdom of your book. The person I'm dating and I have both reflected that our dates have been so much better than anything we found through the dating apps. So I, 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 you know, I, I, I even singles in their, in their mid late thirties, I, I feel like most of them do know somebody who they wondered about dating mm -hmm. and it just, you know, uh, I, you know, uh, reverting to the dating apps, to dating, to going out on blind dates with complete strangers, uh, given the safety risks, given the excessively high breakup rates of online relationships. I just don't think it's a, for most singles, not all, but for most singles, I just don't think it's a good investment of time. Hmm. I totally understand that. And I do believe that finding somebody who has common interests, who belongs to a club you belong to or a house of worship is a great way to go no matter how old you are. And I think what happens as people age is that they stop belonging to clubs and they stop joining groups. Like I belong to Toastmasters and I have been on many meetup groups, hiking groups, and yeah. uh, it took an improv class and somebody asked me out. I mean, it's, it's, it could happen anywhere. And I think that most of us are really closed to how we meet people. I think just opening your mind is yeah, really no, important. No. I mean, my, my favorite dating site is Meetup and Meetup isn't even a dating app. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a um, for, I'm sure most of your listeners know what Meetup is, but just in case it's a, it's kind of a, a website where people with, with, with shared interests can connect, whether you're, a bird watcher, whether you like, you know, going to Knicks games or softball or hiking or biking, whatever, it, it's, it's a way for people with shared interests to connect. And the reason it works so well is because human beings evolved as social animals. We bond through shared experiences and those shared experiences um, become kind of the, the, the foundation, the building blocks for deeper emotional connections. And, um, you know, it, it's it, it actually going hiking with somebody creates a connection very different from trading carefully worded text messages with somebody over Tinder. Yeah, true. I mean, I, I love museum dates and, and oh, absolutely, you know, yeah. going to, to place where you share interests and you can talk about stuff that you have in common without it being an awkward conversation over coffee or right. um, totally agree on that. And, I, and another thing that you and I have emailed about was Clubhouse. Clubhouse has become, um, it's a social, it's a social media app and I totally didn't understand it at all when I first joined but it has actually become a matchmaking site. People are meeting on Clubhouse and I'm, I'm about to interview somebody who found love on Clubhouse. He was written about in Forbes magazine and he flew from San Francisco to New York to meet this woman 
because they met, had shared interests, connected and decided to meet. So it's, it's um, you can definitely expand how you're meeting and find something in common. I love that. And my one clubhouse experience was so bizarre that I haven't, um, I haven't gone <laughs> back yet, but maybe I need to give it another chance. I would definitely give it another chance. I, I was just like, what is this? I was a lurker. I was like, what are these rooms? I don't get it. But I, I do see it as a way to open up new opportunities of connection and networking. And there's so many ways, like um, somebody invited me to a group for Jewish people called Shabbat Shalom group. And it was lovely. It was Jewish people connecting over the Sabbath. Now, if that's important to you, you could meet a potential match there and see how they interact because you're hearing their voice. It's very different from how people show up on Instagram, for example, and put filters on and show this curated life that's not real. The clubhouse is much more authentic to me. And I think it's got, I think it's the future of social media. There are going to be a lot more of these. Yeah, no, I, I, I have no doubt that it's, you know, <laughs> that, that, whether it's a romantic relationship or a friendship, it's pro I, I see more potential with Clubhouse than I do with a dating app because as you suggest, there's less pressure to connect one-on-one. -on -one. It's kind of a more organic way of getting to know somebody. Um, but the, the, my only hesitancy is there's a lot of research that shows that um, the longer two people wait to meet face to face, the less likely it is that they will um, experience feelings of compatibility or closeness. So some some people may be close by and some may be far away, right? And I and no, I, I, I don't mean I don't mean physically close. I mean I mean um, sort see of each uh, other. like yeah, no, just the. Um, you know, the, there was a study done that showed that that uh, they. It paired up um, a, a bunch of college age people in a, um, and for get to know you conversations and half of them met face to face and half of them met um, online. And the, the pairs who initially met um, face to face were 25% more likely to report feelings of, of closeness. Um, it, with the other person, uh, about 10% more likely to report perceived similarity with the, with the person than, than the, the pairs who, who met online. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the study showed is that if the, the, you know, if the people who met online very, very quickly went to meeting face-to-face, -face, you could kind of overcome that gap. But particularly women, very few women are kind of willing to rush into a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody they just met online. So what, you know, th th this, there's th this problem that exists in which, in which the online persona of the person doesn't kind of match up to what, um, what, this person is actually like online. Um, there's no like easy solution to it because of the the safety concerns associated with meeting strangers on you know on a dating app or on, on any app. I recommend getting on a video chat and at least trying to get a sense of who that person is as soon as possible. Uh, I think that's the next best thing to yeah. meeting in person, and it kind of gives you kind of. It, you're able to vet a little bit through the video chat. Um, there's so much we could talk about, and this has been such a great conversation, John. Um, do you have any final words of advice for any women who want to go on their last first date? Live your romantic life, your dating life, the same way you live the rest of your life. So if you're... Um, if you're not afraid to like cold call a venture capitalist for funding for your startup, you shouldn't be afraid to ask golden retriever guy in apartment 5e you know, down the hall from you out on a, on a date. Um, so that's, you know, the, that's the big message of make your move. Um, the other message of make your move is to just encouraging singles to particularly those who've been struggling with dating to get off the dating apps. And, you know, there's a whole, chapter in the book called the make your move offline dating challenge which is kind of a step-by-step -step, um, uh, plan for 
meeting people in the real world, not the virtual one. So that's, that's my big advice. I love it. So John, how can people find you, find your books, all the good stuff? So both Make Your Move and Datanomics are kind of sold at all the major booksellers, um, Amazon, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Indigo, you know, it's pretty much every, every major bookseller. Um, if you're looking to connect with me, um, my website is johnberger.com. My, uh, my name is oddly spelled. It's J-O-N-B-I-R-G-E-R, johnberger1. Uh, I'm sorry, johnberger.com is the website. I'm johnberger1 on Twitter. Unfortunately, it's a little bit different on Instagram. It's john underscore burger1 on Instagram. And finally, um, I do this little thing with, with book clubs. So if you have a book club that wants to read, make your move or datanomics for that matter, um, I've partnered with a, a platform called bookyaya.com and you can schedule me to, to do a virtual Q&A with your book club via bookyaya if, you, if that is of interest. Oh, cool. Well, that'll all be in the show notes. And um, thank you so much. It's really been an enlightening conversation. I'm sure that this is going to really resonate for my audience. Uh, and so good luck with the book sales. I think it's going to do very well, just based on our conversation today. Thanks, Sandy. And thanks for having me back on. Pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for listening. If you love our show, please rate and review us. And we hope you go on your last first date very soon. Bye.